Hi, I'm Sophia. Uh, I want to ask about the role of Tanakh study for a halachically observant Jew. The Tanakh is our national historical document, and it is a part of the halachically observant Jew's life, whether it be from the weekly Torah portion and Haftorah to our connection to Zionism, where depictions in Tanakh connect us more to the land. However, also as a halachically observant Jew, it is difficult for me to turn a blind eye to when the Tanakh does not seem to match our conception of halacha. The classic example of this would be Ein Tachar Ein, an eye for an eye, in Sefer Shemot, but they appear all over the place. Avraham feeding the angels meat and milk together, uh, the Leverite marriage in Megillah Root, not matching up to how it plays out in scenarios in the Talmud, even God's corporeality in Tanakh that is rejected in our modern conception of Jewish theology. How does the reader of Tanakh reconcile with the contemporary reality of Halakha when Halakha is supposed to have the Tanakh as its foundational text and source of knowledge? And yet our Jewish lives today are so different from the life that Tanakh demonstrates. Thank you. Hi, Sophia. Your question is a very interesting one. The relationship between narrative and law in the Torah, in the Tanakh. Let's start at the beginning. It's interesting that the Torah, at least in the book of Breshit, seems to suggest or seems to tell some stories that violate the normative halacha. For instance, as you mentioned, Abraham serves meat and milk to the angels slash people who come to visit him. Yaakov, our forefather Jacob, married two sisters. We're not the first people who've noticed this problem. The Ramban suggests that maybe Yaakov was allowed to marry two sisters because the law only applied to Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov in the land of Canaan, in the land of Israel. But outside the land, they were not limited by the law. And therefore, Rachel died, the Od Kivrat Eretz Lavo Ephrata, just before they, were, they entered the land, since he couldn't be married to two sisters in the land. But I think the real answer to that question is the fact that we have to distinguish between the narrative sections of the Chumash, of the Tanakh, and the legal sections. And the stories in Breshit, as Rashi tells us, they're really there not to teach us the halacha per se, but rather to teach us other lessons. The Ramban tells us ma'asei avot siman mabanim, the purpose of the book of Breshit, is to teach us lessons for future generations. So it's true, of course, that halacha comes up, and some things we learn from those early stories. The mitzvah pruervu, the mitzvah brit milah, the mitzvah gid hanasheh. But that's not the purpose of those stories. And therefore, we need to be willing and able to distinguish between the narrative and the legal sections of halacha. Thank you for your question, and enjoy learning Tanakh. Hi. In Sefer Bereshit, during Brit Mina Pterim, Hashem tells Avraham that his offspring will be strangers and enslaved in a land that is not their own for 400 years, and that they won't return to, in to inherit the land of Canaan until the fourth generation. The reason that is given for this is, Ki lo shalem et ovana emori adhena, for the inequity of the Emirates is not yet complete. My question is, why is the inequity of the Emirates a reason for preventing Nasserah from inheriting the land right away? Why does this mean that they have to go be slaves in a land that's not their own for 400 years? Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for your question. My name is Tammy Jacobowitz and I teach, S I teach Tanakh at SAR High School. And I've been enjoying thinking about what you asked. So first of all, um, the, MO, the MORI that's mentioned in this Pasuk is not necessarily the specific nation of the Emorim, but most Parshanim think that they are representative of all the nations who lived in Canaan. Um, secondly, you asked the question of why should the sins of the Emorim explain why the Jewish people had to be exiled for 400 years. So I think that this pasuk of the key is not coming to explain the entirety of the slavery, and it's not suggesting that the reason why Abraham's descendants have to leave Eretz Canaan is because um, the Emorim have sinned. I think the key is coming just to explain the time. 
and the time of four generations, which is most likely not a generation the way that we would normally count it, but a time span, um, it's explaining why that long. And the length of it, according to, the, to most Parshanim, is because at the same time that B'nai Yisrael are having their own relationship unfolding with Hashem, there is a separate issue, a separate relationship unfolding between Hashem and the, the nations of Canaan. And the nations of Canaan, as we know from later, let's say in Vayikra, in the, um, the, the mitzvot pertaining to Arayot, where we are not allowed to behave like them, and they're kind of basic um, immoral behaviors when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to idolatry, um, toe vote, which are associated with the Shiva Amamim, they have rejected the moral code between themselves and God, not in a covenantal sense, but in a um, mitzvot b'nei noach sense. And what this pasuk is bringing together is that while um, Hashem is arranging for the Jewish people to be enslaved, which is really a separate question. Why is that important? Maybe we can talk about that another time. But the duration of it, they can't come in and inherit Eretz Yisrael properly un until which time the Emorim are either sinful enough that they deserve to be punished, that's what some Parshanim say, or the four generation span is not that their sin will be so big, but that enough time will have been allotted for them to perhaps do tshuva. And once that time has passed, well then God's um, justice system would kick in and allow for the separate track of B'nai Israel to come in. What I, what I really think is amazing about this pasuk, besides kind of imagining these two narratives intersecting, is that um, the pasuk is making very clear what we know from learning Tanakh, that although specifically as Jews, when we read the pasukim, our perspective and our orientation is what does Hashem have in store for us and what is our unique relationship with God, but this pasuk reminds us that we're not the only ones around and that actually our destiny is wrapped up with what is happening to other nations in their own destiny and their own ongoing relationship with Hashem. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a beautiful Shavuot. Megillat Root is an opportunity to see a number of areas of halacha in action, including Hilchot Yibum. In theory, the children of a Leverite marriage, like the one between Root and Boaz, are supposed to be attributed to the woman's deceased first husband. But when baby Oved is born at the end of the Megillah, the neighbors don't say, Yulad ben Lemachlon, they say, Yulad ben Lenaomi. What should we make of this attribution of the baby to Naomi, to whom he is not actually related by blood at all? Is it just a symbolic thing, a comfort to a bereaved mother and potential grandmother? Or does she take on real status as Ovate's mother? And what would that mean? Hi, Zava. Thank you so much for such an insightful and thoughtful question about Naomi and about the attribution of the child that's born as being Yulad ben la Naomi. Um, you know, I think your question and the closing psukim of Parak Dalit of Megillah Root in general highlight a tension that runs throughout the Megillah from the very beginning, which is resolved here. Uh, and that is, while the Megillah is named for Root, I think in many ways it's, it's Naomi who's the character for whom we need to find a place in society. Right? She's the one who's so obviously displaced with the loss of her husband, her sons, no heir, no one to take care of her, no line that comes from her. Uh, in fact, I think you know it's really highlighted even at the beginning of the Megillah when we meet her in the interesting way that she's introduced and she's described, right? Initially in Pasuk Aleph, when we meet her, we're introduced um, to Elimelech and Naomi simply as Ish and Ishto, and only in Pasuk Bet are they identified with proper names, which are then used in Pesukim, Bet, and Gimel. But then in Pesuk Hay, after Elimelech and his sons die, Naomi's referred to not by her name, but simply as Isha. And, and I think the reference there is really significant because unlike in Pasuk Aleph, of Perak Aleph, where we don't yet know her name and, there she's, and therefore she's referred to as Ishto, here we do know her name, and yet she's still referred to as Haisha. And so the narrator at the very beginning when we meet Naomi is trying to convey a very strong emotional effect, right? The narrator wants to emphasize batisha er ha'isha levada, right? The woman stands alone. With the death of her husband and her sons, 
in a foreign place, Naomi has been entirely stripped of her identity and that which makes her important. And so, you know, at this point in the story, when we meet her, it doesn't really matter that she's Naomi, she's simply an Isha, she's a woman who's displaced with no obvious place. And that emotional impact kind of moves throughout the entire narrative and, um, and is resolved at the end. So when I read the last Psukim, where that tension is actually resolved, and the child is born and the child is described, um, that child is described with the same kind of emotional impact as being Naomi's child. Uh, you know, throughout, when we think about Yibum, the Megillah throughout doesn't really operate within the strict context of halachic laws of Yibum. Actually, it's never described as Yibum throughout. We don't see that verb. We don't see that terminology. It's Gula. It's it's similar. It's a bit of a different context. Boaz is not a brother. Boaz is a distant relative. And so we're not strictly operating within the laws of halachic Yibum, despite the similarities. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about, well, this child is technically Machun's child, so in a strict Yibum world, that would be the case. But the Megillah already is not operating within the strict Yibum world. Um, I think what we see here is that the narrator is trying to kind of bring us back to the core issue of the Megillah, which is the Naomi issue, right? She, at this point, and specifically when the townspeople, or the narrator putting it in the mouths of the townspeople, refer to this child, to Ovid, as Naomi's child, the tension and the issue and the Naomi problem, if we may, um, is resolved, right? She's no longer a woman without an obvious place in society. That place and that structure is now kind of contextualized. It's created through Ruth through Roots, through Boaz, through Oved. Um, and ultimately that question and the tension of where does Naomi fit? Where will she go? Where will her line go? Who will her line be? What will happen to her? Will she be displaced? She has no one, is resolved. So at least kind of in the way I read it, um, the description of the child as Naomi's child is designed to convey that emotional impact, that emotional effect, rather than being a biological reality or a technical legal description of the status of this child. It's, well, what was the problem in this book? The problem in this book was actually, where would Naomi fit in society? How would she go on? What would her place be? What does that look like? And so here, we close it with that sense of, we now know, right? She's taken care of, she has a line, she has a child, she has continuity, she has a place. Um, but again, thank you for the excellent question and I hope that this answers it um, and enlightens your reading. Thanks so much. Hello, my question is with regards to King Asa in Sefer Dibri Hayamin Betz. The Sukim described that after he sought the help of the king of Aram to fight off the king of Israel, uh, the Navi Hanani comes up to him and says, Ki me ata yesh imcha milchamot, that you're going to have to fight wars in the future as a result of seeking help from Aram rather than asking from Hashem. And yet in the very next uh, psukim, it's described that King Asa passes away shortly thereafter. So my question is, which were the milchamot that the Navi Hanani promised were going to occur to the King Asa? Chaim, that is a great question because Hanani's message to Asa actually gets us to the heart of one of the themes of Dere Yamim. And that theme is that kings who rely on God alone thrive, and those who don't and rely on others fail. Now Asa is already a complicated figure in this regard. Just two prakim earlier, we read the story of Zerach the Kushite, who invaded with a million soldiers. And at that point, Asa said, Turns to God and says, we're only relying on you. And God immediately saves the people. That was in Perak Yudal in 14. Now in 16, Asa turns to Ben-Hadad, the king of Damascus, for help against Baasha, the king of Israel. Now, this succeeds. Ben-Hadad and Asa successfully drive off Baasha. But as Chaim, as you say, at this point, Hanani shows up and says that as a result of this distrust in God, Asa must fail. He must lose in subsequent wars. 
And he has to. Uh, we understand that. Because without that failure, we would have an example of a king who didn't rely on God and yet succeeded. Now, Chaim, your point is well taken. We don't read about these wars. We don't read of wars in which Asa fails. Now, Devere Amim does say, and just a couple of lines later, that there's more in the sources than, than, uh, than it's telling us. In this case, And of course, this is a, a refrain both in the book of Melachim and in the book of Devere Amim, uh, that the rest of the deeds of the kings, they're written in the Chronicles. Now, it's, the truth is, it's an open question as to what sources the author of Devere Amim would have had about Asa, who lived about 500 years earlier than the book was written. I suspect that if the author knew of specific wars, he would have included them. But the point, in any event, is that there must have been such wars, and that Asa must fail to keep up the, point, the, the claim that a king who relies on anyone other than God won't be successful. Thanks for the question. It's fantastic. The book of Eov starts with Eov being visited and sort of comforted by three friends. Um, but then they leave off and, and a fourth person arrives, Elihu. And at the end of the book, there's no mention of Elihu as one of the comforters. And I, I haven't seen a good explanation for Elihu's appearance in the book other than that he's... Uh, an interpolation by by another author who thought he had a better set of arguments than than the original author but Ellie whose arguments aren't even all that particularly good as far as I can understand them and I'm wondering if there's a good uh, explanation for this hello I'm Nathaniel Berman and I want to speak to Steve's excellent question about the identity of Elihu in the book of Job um, as Steve pointed out, Elihu kind of mysteriously appears towards the end of the book, gives a set of speeches, and then disappears, and is never mentioned again. And uh, this has given rise to some speculation about whether the whole Elihu episode is an interpolation by a later author. Um, and if so, as so often with these kind of puzzling features of the biblical text, um, the Jewish tradition already noticed these kinds of questions before biblical critics uh, use them to uh, try to figure out the different layers of authorship of the text. And the identity of the mysterious Elihu gave rise to a lot of interesting speculation um, at different stages of the tradition. And I'm going to give you some sources on it. If you'll bear with me, I'm going to set up a little PowerPoint I made. So, who was the mysterious Elihu, the son of Berachel, the Buzite of the family of Ram? Or in Hebrew, Elihu ben Berachel Habuzi, Ibish Pahad Ram. I'm going to give you two sources on this. One is from a 13th century Midrashic collection called the Yalkut Shimoni, which um, gathers Midrashim from earlier times um, of uncertain dates. And the Yalkut actually gives two different views about it. So first, in the name of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva founded Elihu is Bil'am. Bil'am, who is, of course, a, a, a negative figure uh, in the Torah, um, and they explain his name, in, the name of Elihu, in terms of the features of Bila, the son of Barachel, for he came to curse Israel, and God blessed them. Baracha. The Buzait, for his prophecy was despised, Bazui, of the family of Ram from Aram. So a completely negative uh, uh, character, although Bilam is a very strange character in the Bible because he, on the one hand, wants to do harm to Israel. On the other hand, he seems to have some kind of relationship to God and actually speaks God's word when it, when it comes down to actually 
seeing the people of Israel. It turns out Rabbi Akiva is not alone. In the same uh, Midrashic passage, we have a very different view. Rabbi Eliezer says, Elihu is Isaac, Isaac the son of Abraham. Ben Barachel, for God blessed him. Barachel, the Buzite, for he despised Bazaar idolatry when he was bound. Of the family of Ram, of the family of Abraham. And we know that Abraham's original name was Abram, Abram. So here we have two very, very different ideas about Elihu. One is that he was this uh, non-Jewish prophet who was also portrayed as an evil figure. And the other is that he was Isaac, the son of Abraham, one of the forefathers, one of the patriarchs. Um, one might say that Isaac is also something of an ambiv ambiguous or ambivalent figure in the Torah. On the one hand, he's one of the patriarchs. On the other hand, he does have to suffer this terrible experience, several ordeal of being bound and in fear of his life. Um, he also later on favors his uh, son uh, Esau, Esau instead of the it's of Jacob, who's the forefather of the Jewish people, um, and this partiality of Isaac for for his son Esau is something that has given rise to a lot of commentary in the tradition and outside of it. Um, so Elihu is this this strange figure, and I think the rabbis here, the authors of these midrashim, are wrestling with who is this figure and the fact that there are these two really opposite uh, images of him, that he's Bilam, that he's Isaac. It's a very, very strange feature. We're really trying to figure out who he is and the perplexity of who this figure is. Of course, the very name Elihu suggests a mystery. Elihu, if you divide into two words, would mean, he is my God. This would be one way of actually translating the term Elihu. Um, I say that the, the, the both Bilam and Isaac have their downsides and their shadow side. Bilam is that, that sort of downside is more foregrounded in the Torah. In Isaac, it's more implicit. It's really unclear why he has to suffer this ordeal and why um, he is uh, portrayed in later life as favoring his uh, his son Esau, who in tradition is viewed as an evil figure. Um, so who is this figure? Who is this figure, Elihu? And again, this is this, the mystery, the mystery that Bible critics will take up and view as evidence of the, the fragmentary or the, or the layered nature of the biblical text. Maybe that's true historically, maybe not. Was a thing that fired up the, the rabbinic imagination to try to figure out some of these mysteries. Now I'm going to turn to the Zohar, the great work of 13th century Kabbalah, and see what they say. So for the Zohar, the Zohar first it accepts the notion that he that that Elihu was of the seed of Abraham. It doesn't, it doesn't actually say he was Isaac. He says from the seed of Abraham. He says that's true. He says but. But then there's a, a more mysterious or more secret explanation. It says, Elihu was a priest of the seed of Ezekiel the prophet. And partly it's because Elihu is called Habuzi, the Buzite, and Ezekiel is called Ben Buzi, the son of Buzi. And so they make that connection to associate Elihu with Ezekiel, who's one of the most visionary prophets um, in, the whole, uh, in the whole Bible. And it gives a, a number of commentaries about Elihu's name, I'm going to give you a couple of them here, of the family of Ram. Now, Ram literally means elevated. And the, and the Zohar comments, superior to all. And then it goes on. Why was he called the Buzite, Abuzi? For he abased, Mivazet, himself in relation to anyone greater than him. And this is why he rises in the superior name Buzite. The one who is called the human being perfect in everything. So this humility, this ability to abase yourself in relationship to those who are greater than you, the Zohar says, this is what makes you perfect, so it makes you superior to all. And again, the Zohar is 
very much focused on this notion that Elihu was an extraordinary being, perhaps even superhuman in some way, or angelic, or mystical, some kind of mystical being. And I think Steve's question really highlights that. Elihu appears out of nowhere towards the end of the book and then disappears, never mentioned again. Now, another passage in the Zohar tries to explain why it is that Elihu is the one, only one of Job's friends who Job does not answer. Now, one possible explanation would be, as to be uh, uh, suggested, is that the, the chapters about Elihu were added later. That's certainly one possible explanation. Another explanation is that Job had no answer to Elihu's arguments. And in fact, if you look at Eli, the passages in Elihu, they're not that dissimilar to what God eventually says at the end of the book of Job. And then the Zohar says something very interesting. This is from a different passage in the Zohar. And it says this, come and see. Also against his three friends was Job's wrath kindled because they had found no answer. That's from Job chapter 32. And the Zohar says, so there's the three friends who are not Elihu in other words. The Zohar says this, these others had said words but Job was not comforted through them. From here we learn, and this I love this, that one who goes to comfort a mourner should firmly ground his words before him. If you go to comfort a mourner, don't just go there and wing it. You should think it through and think how to say it. And I think that's what the Zohar is saying. So this is firmly ground. So I'm translating the word liyastad. To put on a firm foundation. Can't just say anything. For he, Job, and I'm going on the text, needed words that he could acknowledge and accept the judgment and acknowledge the Holy King. And, and the Zohar goes on and says that the friends, what the friends said was true. The friends had said true words, but they didn't say it in a way that Job could accept it. And then once Job heard Elihu's words, he accepted, he accepted the judgment of the king. He did Siduk uh, It's what we say when somebody dies, we say, blessed is the true judge or the judge of truth. It's Siduk We accept the judgment even if we can't understand. And it was something about the way Elihu spoke. And I think this relates back to the question of Isaac. Because the Zohar and other Kabbalistic texts very much accept that Elihu was somehow related to Isaac, and Isaac in the Kabbalistic tradition is associated with the attribute of judgment. Um, and sure enough, Elihu does speak some stern words to Job, um, but in such a way that Job can accept it, that somehow it's judgment, as, as it says in the Kabbalistic text, tempered by mercy, sweetened by, by compassion. Um, and there's something very, very profound here about what you do when you go to comfort somebody, when you go to speak to someone, you have to speak to them truth. Otherwise, they won't even hear it. If you just say platitudes, they won't even hear it if they're honest with themselves. And if you're too harsh, also won't hear it. That there's somehow, there's some relationship between truth, frank truth, and somehow said in such a way that can be accepted that can be heard, that can be internalized. And that is the true comfort. And that is why Elihu, this magical figure, according to the Zohar, is the true friend of Job. So I hope that's responsive uh, to that excellent question, Steve. And um, I hope to see you all again. Thanks.